Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, showing me this absolutely beautiful uh, facility. And it's an uh, honor to be here. And I kind of feel in some ways uh, what I write about and what I speak about in my own mission as a, a rabbi and teacher is, is very consistent with uh, the uh, Theosophic Society in, in that one of my goals is bringing people together and, and seeing what um, common religious experiences and feelings we all have. Uh, and that's truly, um, it's, it's needed more in our world today. I think part of the mission of the, of the society uh, is, is needed now more than ever. Uh, because there's uh, so much division, so much uh, orthodoxy and kind of not seeing the other side. Uh, and, and what we do here really uh, helps us uh, in, in the quest of seeing and appreciating the other. And uh, that was actually part of the motivation for writing this book as well. Uh, uh, what, what I was thinking I, I would do is kind of start and just give you a little personal background as to how I got into this. Uh, how, how did a rabbi write a book about Jesus? Uh, and then um, talk a little bit about how we can, um, as, as searchers, as people who are interested in the wisdom of our traditions, how uh, we can see some of the Jewish depth uh, of Jesus as resonating in our own lives and in uh, modern culture. So uh, for several years, I was the assistant rabbi at a synagogue downtown. Uh, and wa we had a wonderful relationship with a neighboring church, uh, Fourth Presbyterian Church, uh, which is on Michigan Avenue, a beautiful church. And they asked me to teach a class on the Jewish holidays. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, I, we said, fine, I, 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 uh, I w uh, was happy to do it. And the only date we could find was a Sunday morning in February at 8 o'clock. Uh, so that uh, I, 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 I didn't think that uh, I would get such great attendance uh, at, at my class, but it ended up getting you know really wonderful attendance. And I think part of it was that there were a lot of people uh, who were interested, Christians who were interested in learning about Judaism. And, uh, and, and, and I think that the reasons for that are twofold. First is that there are many, many more interfaith relationships, marriages today than there have ever been in America. And so many families have, uh, have multiple religions within the family. And second thing is those who are interested in appreciating their own faith, if you're Christian, in a sense need to understand Judaism because uh, if you want to know Jesus better, you have to know Judaism because Jesus was Jewish and a practicing Jew. And so uh, this, this, uh, the popularity of this class led to uh, our hosting an interfaith Seder. Seder is a Passover meal where we recount the exodus from Egypt. Uh, and we, we did an interfaith Seder with Fourth, Fourth Presbyterian Chicago Sinai, my synagogue, Holy Name Cathedral, and for a couple years we even had Moody uh, as part of it, which was which was quite interesting, and um, it was just a wonderful experience. And out of that experience, uh, I wrote my first book, which was called "What Every Christian Needs to Know About Passover," and that was sort of a a uh, people kept asking me, "Well, we want to learn more about Passover. We want to learn more about Passover. What is there?" And there really was nothing. There was, uh, I mean, there were books about Passover, but not none that were really for Christians interested in learning about it. So that book then led to The Jewishness of Jesus. And that, that book kind of took off and is, uh, has done well. And, 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 um, and really, uh, I've, it's been something that I have been able to see really uh, helps. It, it's really for Christians. I mean, I wrote the book for Christians, even though I've talked about it in synagogues. But it's actually for all people who want to understand some of the uh, formative religious experiences and moments that, that shaped where we are today religiously. So the first thing, kind of one of the, the, the misconceptions that a lot of people have about the Jewishness of Jesus is that when, when people think about somebody Jewish, they tend to think about the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, uh, that that is what defines Judaism. But truthfully, a Jewish person today does not have much to do with the Old Testament. Just open up the book of Leviticus. Open up the Leviticus, the central book of the Torah, the five books of Moses. Do you ever, do you, would you go to a synagogue and see anything resembling the book of Leviticus? No, I mean, it's a sacrificial system. So really, biblical Judaism was one phase of Jewish life. And that was the phase that began when Moses 
uh, led the Israelites across uh, the, the wilderness. Um, they arrived in, in, in Israel. Eventually, Solomon built a temple, and there were priests in the temple that offered sacrifices. And uh, the sacrificial offerings were the ancient Israelite form of worship. The first temple was destroyed in 586 BCE. The second temple was created, and then the second temple was destroyed in 70 CE. So, and, and then Judaism changed dramatically. So the first phase of Judaism, the first phase, which, we, which is the Judaism of the Hebrew Bible, lasts from about 1200 to about 50 CE. And that's the phase, that's the kind of Judaism we see in the book of Leviticus. But the kind of Judaism that Jesus practiced, the kind of Judaism that Jews today practice is really rabbinic Judaism. And it's almost a different religion. Uh, because instead of being centered on the temple, it's centered on the home. Instead of it being about offering sacrifices, which are, um, you know, work of our hands, it's the, wor it's the words from our hearts. So there's a real transformation in Judaism. And one of the things I've often tried to, to emphasize, and, I, and I've spoken about this in churches, is that Jesus is much more of a rabbinic Jew than a biblical Jew. So let me just talk a little bit about what those differences are, because they're, they're important. Um, the first is the role of, of the priests. Now, in biblical Judaism, the priests were essentially the intermediaries between the people and God. If you wanted to worship God, you would bring a sacrificial offering. Uh, it was a lamb on Passover. It was often a bull. You would bring this offering. The priests would slaughter it, and it would burn on the altar, and the incense would rise, and the incense, that smell, was an offering to God. That was worship. It was through the priests. And the priests had to abide by a whole host of regulations. The priests, you know, had to, had to have a certain kind of purity. The priests really didn't interact much with uh, the laity, uh, and there was a fairly hierarchical system. That begins to crumble around 300 BCE, when a group um, arises called the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees are often given a bad name in the Gospels, but they were actually a very democratic, sort of justice-seeking group. The Pharisees said, the priests, they believe that they're, they're the only portal to God. But actually, all, of the, all Israelites are priests. All Israelites are sacred. And so we should have just as much access to God as the priests. So the Pharisees started uh, modeling some of the behaviors of the priests. They started eating in a priestly manner, following the dietary laws. They started teaching the Torah, the five books of Moses. So they were popular teachers of the Torah. They, in, they, they came from the common stock. They were lower class and middle class Jews, whereas the priests were sort of the aristocrats. And so this group uh, gained a lot of power. They taught via story. Uh, and over time, the priesthood kept becoming more and more corrupt, and the Pharisees kept becoming more and more popular. Until by the time the, the wars with the Romans in 66 CE, there was a major war with the Romans, and then it ended in 70 CE where Rome destroyed the second temple. If you've ever been to Israel, you see the <clears throat> Western Wall. That's the last part of that second temple. Uh, and when that temple is destroyed, the only group left standing that has any religious authority are the Pharisees. And so then the Pharisees become what we now call the rabbis, the sages. Uh, and they were teachers. They were popular teachers. Jesus grows up in a culture that's really infused with Pharisaic teaching. And again, in the Gospels, the Pharisees are kind of given a negative tinge oftentimes. But many of Jesus' teachings are very much Pharisaic teachings. The Pharisees have a, a story that's virtually exactly the same as the prodigal son story. Uh, there are the, the idea of love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These are teachings that were sacred to the Pharisees as well. So all of these, all of the, uh, not all, but most of the parables and the teachings we often associate with Jesus are very much rooted in Jewish custom. Uh, and many of the, the events that happen in Jesus' life uh, are also very consistent with Judaism, and we can see some of the deeper meanings. 
So for example, in the first chapter of the book, I talk about the scene where three uh, uh, wise men, so they, you know, magi, uh, come and tell uh, Joseph and Mary that uh, you know they're uh, they're going to have a son uh, uh, and it will be a uh, sacred sacred event. Uh, virtually the exact same thing happens in the book of Genesis. Uh, in Genesis 20, uh, Abraham and Sarah are sitting in a tent in the wilderness. Three men approach the tent uh, and they come to the tent in order to tell Abraham and Sarah that they will soon have a child. Now, Sarah is in her 90s, so she really, doesn't really believe them at first, um, uh, uh, but it happens. Uh, and, 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 and it turns out those three wise men were angels all along. Uh, and so this, this uh, early scene in Jesus' life is very much reflective that uh, uh, has that sort of angelic quality from the Old Testament. The, the, the uh, journey to Egypt in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus, uh, or, or, uh, Joseph and Mary take Jesus down to Egypt. That's another common trope that we see in the Hebrew Bible. When things get tough, you go to Egypt, right? When, when, when Abraham experiences a famine in the land, then later on when Jacob experiences a famine in the land, where do they go? They go to Egypt. They go to Egypt for refuge and safety. So this is exactly what Jesus does, or Joseph and Mary do, uh, when, uh, when, when, Herod, when, when Herod sends out, essentially tries to find uh, this, this future king. Uh, so reading the, the New Testament, in a sense, with the eyes of the old, with the eyes of the rabbis, with the eyes of rabbinic Judaism, gives it a whole nother layer of depth. And one of the great tools uh, of, of this kind of reading is called midrash. Has anyone heard the, the term midrash before? What does midrash mean? I think it's part of the Talmud. Yeah, yeah. A midrash is, uh, is a part of the Talmud. And, and the, the Talmud is essentially uh, 63 volumes of teachings. A lot of it is just legal debate. You know, uh, is this the right time to observe the Sabbath? Or is this the right time to observe the Sabbath? Is this food kosher to eat? Is this? So a lot of the Talmud is, is, is those kinds of teachings. But a whole other section of the Talmud are what are really legends, stories, and that's Midrash. And what Midrash does is it fills in the gaps and answers some of the questions that are left by the biblical text. So I'll just give you a kind of funny common example. Well, if Adam and Eve were the only two people on earth and they had kids, who did Cain marry? Right? If there's no other people. So Midrash answers those kinds of questions. You know, where do, you know, where do other people come from? Why does God choose Abraham? One of the most famous Midrash uh, stories is, you know, the Torah never says, of all the people in the world, why did God start talking to Abraham? We don't see any, Abraham doesn't do anything to, to, to deserve God's attention. He's just wandering. So, so the Midrash says, oh, no, 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 Abraham was a very, very important person. And it, Midrash tells a story that when Abraham was a child, his father was an idol maker and his, and, and his father sold these big idols and Abraham realized what a foolish thing that was to sell idols. So one day, he, while his father was gone, he took a big uh, club and he smashed all the idols to pieces and then he put the club in the hands of the largest idol and that when his father came home and saw what had happened, he was devastated. He said, you just destroyed my livelihood and said, Abraham said, no, it wasn't me, it was the biggest idol. Uh, and so, you know, that Abraham understood the foolishness of idolatry uh, and that's why God chose him. So the Midrash does this kind of thing. It uses stories and legends to teach lessons. And so the, the, clearly the authors of the Gospels of the New Testament, they knew Midrash very, very, very well. Um, and so looking at, looking at some of the stories that we see about Jesus' life are, are really um, quite enriched by knowing some Midrash. Another example is Right, uh, you know, after uh, the baptism, and by the way, baptism is just another form of what's called mikvah. Uh, anyone know what, what's a mikvah? Yes. Uh, right. So mikvah is a sort of kind of a purification bath, and um, it has to have water from a natural source. 
But essentially, and there, there's, you, you go into a, a mikvah and you purify yourself. And so it's often used, people will go and, and get into a state of purity before the holidays. Uh, women often use mikvah uh, after childbirth, and so there's all kinds of um, practices around that. Um, and uh, the, over time, by the time you get to John the Baptist, it's, it's a broader purification that you go immerse yourself in a, a natural running body of water and you come out purified. And so that's what happens. Uh, it's just a, uh, uh, you know, John the, Bapti- John, John the Baptist could be John the mikvah guy. You know, I mean, it's really, it's, it's, it's virtually the same thing. There's that same function. So after the, uh, the baptism, Jesus goes and has these three temptations in the wilderness. Well, this is very much along the same lines as what happens with Abraham. Abraham is tested several times. Uh, the most famous test, of course, is the, uh, you know, where God says, take your son, your favorite son, bring him upon uh, the top of the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice. You know, and Ab- Abraham uh, passes that test. I mean, again, there's lots of Midrash questioning. You know, basically the Midrash argues that Abraham really knew that God was never going to ask him to carry through. Because the, the authors of the Midrash, these were, these were rabbis, and they were, they were very humanistic. They, I mean, they, they, they believed God wrote the Torah, but they, didn't, they, they believed that God would never ask them to do anything that was morally heinous or terrible. And so the idea that Abraham would sacrifice his son was, was kind of an anathema. They, 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 they could not believe that about Abraham. So they, but they also believed that God wrote this text. So what they did is they, they used Midrash to kind of um, deconstruct it, essentially, and say, well, Abraham knew that God wasn't really going to follow through um, because uh, Abraham would never tell a lie like Abraham Lincoln. And, and you know, you go up the mountain and Abraham says, we, the boy and I will return to you at the end of this journey. So Abraham knew that God wasn't going to ask him. You know, so the rabbis looked very closely at the language of the text, and the language says the two of them will return. So Abraham knew that he was never going to really have to sacrifice. There are even some midrash that say Abraham failed the test, that he should not have obeyed God. I mean, this is a pretty audacious midrash that, that says, you know, in fact, God was looking for Abraham to say, no, why would you ask me to do such a crazy thing? And part of the reason they make that argument is God says to Abraham, take your son. But then at the end, only an angel says to Abraham, don't slay your son. And, and God never talks with Abraham again. Only, a, only the angel talks. So essentially, maybe God was punishing Abraham because he actually did follow the instructions. Now that seems kind of, you know, it's a little bit far-fetched, but the, the Midrash can often be far-fetched. So the temptations in the wilderness, knowing a lot about the tests of Abraham can help us understand the purpose of these tests uh, in the wilderness. Um, then I have a whole chapter in a sense about the education of Jesus. Now, what would happen a young Jewish uh, a boy who uh, uh, was born at that time of, of life, what would be the typical educational path? Um, well, probably he would be trained in rabbinic Judaism. He would be trained in the law and in, and in Midrash. Now, it wasn't, education wasn't universal at that time, but it was pretty close, right, for, for, for males. For females, there wasn't a complete education, but it was pretty standard that at least you, it, starting at age three, you would study the Bible. Then at age five, you'd start studying the Talmud. And then at, by age 10, you would have mastered them all. I mean, this, you know, this is what the, you know, the hope. Um, uh, and uh, so Jesus would have received this kind of Jewish education. And the only thing that the, the Gospels tell us about the early life of Jesus is that period at age 12, when he is teaching in the temple. Now, I make an argument in the book that's not original with me, but you know, some scholars believe it, that that bar mitzvah, that that teaching might have been Jesus's bar mitzvah. You know, this was at a typical time, a Jewish child, male at age 12 or 13, would read from the Torah and teach from the Torah. That was part of the educational path. 
And that's the only thing we see about uh, Jesus' adolescence. So, so that could have been a bar mitzvah. Again, nobody really knows. Um, let's see. So we have that educational part. Then, understanding what happens next. So the culture of rabbinic Judaism, the way rabbinic Judaism survived was every rabbi would cultivate disciples, essentially. And those disciples would follow the rabbi around from town to town and listen to and repeat his teachings and live with the rabbi. That's exactly what we see happen with Jesus. Jesus goes, he cultivates disciples, you know, becomes, become fishers of men, and travels from town to town teaching. This was the pattern by which, um, by which a person gained influence, a teacher gained influence. And so the, 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 um, the rabbis of the time would, if you wanted to be a leader, you would essentially find disciples and then go from town to town. And that's what Jesus does. Uh, and the disciples, or the apostles, very much play the role that disciples played. And um, one of the, I have a whole little section, what makes someone qualified to be a disciple, right? That this, was, this was an interesting question. And, and there really isn't something except a kind of instant connection. And that's why when Jesus goes and finds the disciples, you don't see, like, they don't have like a job interview to be a disciple. You don't go through like a whole series of questions. It's more like, yep, I'll follow you. It's very much this kind of instant connection. And that, 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 was, that was common at the time. That's how it was more about personality than about kind of qualifications. Um, another thing that we see, obviously, that's sort of essential to Jesus's ministry and something we see quite frequently in the Jewish texts is the practice of, of sort of miraculous healing. Uh, so, so healing is a, is a, obviously we see it throughout the, the, the Gospels. Uh, and that has often been one of those points where a lot of people said, this is where Jesus departed from Judaism, in that there were these miraculous healings. But the truth is, the notion of, of a miraculous healing is not uncommon at all in rabbinic Judaism. Uh, the Pharisees did healings all the time. Again, this is a sort of a, a very typical misconception that the Pharisees were kind of legalists and all they cared about was following the letter of the law and Jesus was spiritual and cared about love and about healing and so forth. But there are all kinds of instances in the Talmud uh, where uh, rabbis perform healings. Um, there was something, there was a common People knew about mental illness back then. They just didn't call it mental illness. It was called that you had um, a kind of evil spirit inside of you. And there are all kinds of instances where the rabbis would go and they would essentially communicate with the evil spirit and tell it to leave. Uh, and and that this, this you, you see examples of this in the Talmud. Um, and you even see examples of healings happening on the Sabbath, right? There's a whole section in, 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 in the in the Gospels, I think it's in the Gospel of Matthew, where you see this, uh, you see a group of, of Pharisees, they're called scribes, uh, say to Jesus, why are you healing in the temple on the Sabbath? You're not supposed to be doing this. The Sabbath is, you're not supposed to be doing anything productive or creative. You're supposed to be praying. Uh, and and, and sim that's simply not true. There were healings that were done on the Sabbath. What is true is that at this time in history, this was a time where a lot of what we understand as Judaism was in formation. A lot of things were still being debated. And one could say, one could look at a spectrum and say there's Jesus, there's Paul, there's Rabbi Akiba, Rabbi Hillel, all these other famous rabbis, and they're all on this spectrum. And they're all trying to offer an answer to the question as to what does it mean to be a good Jew? in the first century. And they're offering different answers. Paul says, to be a good Jew means you have to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. This is what Paul never considered, Paul always considered himself Jewish, right? Uh, Paul, Paul believed he was Jewish till the day he died. He just believed in order to be a good Jew, you had to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus lived and died a Jew, but he, I mean, obviously, 
he didn't start Christianity. He believed himself a Jew, but his Judaism began to depart from the traditional Judaism of the time. But even calling it traditional Judaism is probably an error. There were multiple Judaisms. There was a lot of, of sort of debate and discussion. One of the most famous is in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is and disciples are gathering grains on the Sabbath. And uh, the scribes come out and say, what are you doing gathering grains? You're not supposed to be doing that on the Sabbath. And Jesus goes, actually, there's nothing wrong with gathering grains on the Sabbath. You have to eat. And the Sabbath, the, the law says, for the saving of life, you're allowed to work on the Sabbath. And you have to eat in order to live. King David actually uh, gathered grains on the Sabbath. So it's perfectly kosher. So what, what, the important part here is that Jesus was not violating Judaism. Jesus was not leaving Judaism. These were debates within Judaism. And so this is, this is, by the way, you know, a lot of people say that one of the great origins of anti-Semitism is that saying from the gospel, I think it's in Matthew, uh, his blood is be on us and on our children, right? And that the argument was that all Jews are responsible for the death of Jesus for generations. But these were Jews leveling charges at other Jews. This is not like Christians saying, Jews, you're responsible. There was no such thing as Christians. The idea, the, the, the notion of Christianity as separate from Judaism is not until 100 years after the death of Jesus. So that's partly one of the reasons I wrote this book is that there is um, a kind of feeling that if we can understand the conversations that were going on 100 years ago, perhaps the kind of tensions that we see today would not feel as sharp uh, because Christianity really begins as a religion within Judaism or as a sect within Judaism. Even by the time of Jesus' death, you know, there's, you know, Paul is beginning to sort of move or create a new kind of Judaism, but it's still within the framework of the Jewish people. Now, nobody knows exactly, and I kind of talk a little bit about this in the, in, in the last chapter, nobody knows exactly when Christianity and Judaism split, you know, permanently, where Christianity essentially becomes a new religion. Well, we know certainly by the time of the Council of Nicaea that, that Christianity is a separate religion, you know, but how did that separation come about? is a very complex question. You know, one of the, it used to be, most scholars would say that by the destruction of the temple in 70 CE, when the Romans destroyed the temple, that was a turning point because for a couple reasons. First, many of the more traditional Jewish followers of Jesus, those who were ethnic Jews, so, so the first followers of Jesus were all born Jews. Right? They, they, they were Jews. They, were, they, were, they had Jewish mothers. And so in the first apostles, the first people that were Jesus' followers were all born Jews. Paul said, well, we're not getting enough born Jews to follow us, to follow Jesus. So, he's gonna, so Paul opened it up to the Gentiles. Paul said, you don't have to be born Jewish in order to be, you don't have to be uh, born Jewish in order to be a Jewish follower of Jesus. Essentially, he said, you can, you can become part of the Jewish people, this particular branch of the Jewish people that were a follower of Jesus, just by believing that Jesus was the Messiah. So Paul essentially opens up uh, the group to Gentiles. What happens over time is the, the demographics change. The majority, by the time of Paul's death, the majority of the followers of Jesus are no, are no longer born Jews. So the, the weight has shifted towards people who converted into it. So the, and those who are born Jews, who are Jewish followers of Jesus, many of them die in 70 CE in fighting the Romans because the, they were based in Jerusalem and Jerusalem is destroyed. So after 70 CE, most followers of Jesus are no longer ethnic Jews. And that changes the dynamic. So you start to see more of a split between the kind of people who believe that they are upholding the faith into which they are born and those who have come to the faith from others.
or, or from a different perspective, usually paganism. Um, now, but that still not that still doesn't mark the full split. Some of the split is exacerbated by the Romans. So after the destruction of the temple, the Romans don't like traditional Jews, nor do they like the Jewish followers of Jesus. So the Gospels become more anti-Pharisaic during this time because in, in, in some ways to say the real enemies of Rome are not the followers of Jesus, they're the Pharisees, the ones who were the Jewish people who rejected Jesus. So if you look at the chronology of the Gospels, you can look at the role of Pontius Pilate and it becomes, he, he becomes more and more um, anti, and, become, how, how to phrase it, he becomes uh, less of a villain in every, in, 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 through the gospel. So in Matthew, he is the one who is basically totally responsible for, for the death of Jesus. By the time you get to John, it's because Pontius Pilate is so pushed by the high priests and by the Pharisees that he has to go through with it, even though he didn't really want to. And that is essentially in order to appease the Romans. Because, you know, they can't say Pontius Pilate didn't do it. I mean, you can't totally rewrite the story, you know, but you can change the motivation of the person. I mean, this is not anything new. I mean, you know, biblical scholars have known this for a long time, but the motivation in many ways was to create a greater chasm between the followers of Jesus and the uh, more traditional Jews. But Jesus himself, and this is one of the things I kind of try to make over and over as a point in the book, was a fairly typical first century Jew. And as I was writing this, and I think a question that's kind of relevant for us today is, why now? Why hasn't this been recognized or discussed um, uh, until really the last 30 years? Well, actually, it's a little longer. In fact, as I was learning a little bit more about the Theosophic Society in preparation for tonight and the era in which the society grew, you know, late 19th, early 20th centuries, this was the beginning of the time when people started to really investigate the Jewishness of Jesus. That in a sense, the same motivations that led to, that, that created this society were the motivations that led scholars to start saying, well, shouldn't we, st we, everyone always knew Jesus was Jewish. I mean, it's, I guess there are small pockets that don't like, you know, maybe there are people in, in, you know, Southern Baptist communities who believe Jesus was a Southern Baptist. I, you know, <laughs> but, but most people recognize that Jesus was Jewish. But most people just kind of ignored that and said, well, he really transcended Judaism because he is God and, and became God. And, and so the Jewish background really, it doesn't, it's not very important. But this same period, late 19th, early 20th century, there was started to be a re-examination of, well, if we're in an era where we're trying to bring about more interreligious cooperation, what better way to do that than to look at how the you know, center of one religion is actually rooted in another religion. So you had some scholars. One of them was based here in Chicago named Rabbi Emil Hirsch, who really focused on, he used to refer to Jesus as the rabbi of Bethlehem. Uh, and, and looking at a lot of the teachings, especially the teachings about social justice. Remember, this is the era in Christianity of the social gospel, of Judaism, of, a, of, of sort of a very uh, a social justice-oriented focus, uh, that, that, this, that these teachings are really rooted in the Hebrew prophets, Amos, Isaiah, Jeremiah. So you have this phase where the Jewishness of Jesus is starting to come under greater investigation. Then there's another group of scholars who are beginning to see, there's a guy named Chaim uh, uh, Maccoby who teaches at Hebrew University. He did teach at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And he begins to <clears throat> argue that Jesus was a very, he was a military leader of the Jewish people. And, and people were calling him the Messiah because he was a leader who was ready to lead the Jews in unseating Rome as as the, the, the ruler that he, the Messiah was going to be a, a politician, a political warrior who would restore independence to the Jewish state. And again, this was a period when Zionism was taking off. So Jesus was recast as a, as a political leader 
If anyone ever read the book Zealot, which was published about three, four years ago by Reza Aslan, I mean, Reza Aslan just sort of you know, repeated some of these arguments that were made earlier that Jesus was a, a, a political zealot, uh, a social justice zealot, but even more so somebody who was really ready to restore Jewish sovereignty to the land of Israel, and that's why he was murdered by the Romans. <clears throat> there's not much evidence for that, but there is some, there's, that's one theory. Another theory about the Jewishness of Jesus, which is more contemporary, 70s and 80s, it was um, really uh, promulgated by a guy named John Dominic Crossan, who taught at Loyola University for a period of time. And, and Crossan believed that Jesus was sort of a typical a Mediterranean, in a sense, peasant, but not in a negative sense, was a lower class person who really believed in social justice and took the Jew and gave the Jewish teachings of the prophets of Amos and Isaiah new light in this world that was increasingly corrupt. I mean, the first century, Palestine was not a great place to live. I mean, Herod had taxed the people, you know, so much in order to build, to, to create these massive building projects. 99% of the population was very poor. And there was a feeling if you, if you're Jewish and you're living under Roman rule at the time, and you're reading this book that talks about where God chose, where God's chosen people, God gave us this land, land flowing with milk and honey, and you're sitting there and you have Roman garrisons all over the city, you have Roman rulers taking your money and building massive castles, but then you're reading in a book that you're the chosen people and you're going to prosper in the land, there's certain a cognitive dissonance there. So the people were ready, the people were ready for a kind of, um, fervor and, and, and revolution, essentially. And so Jesus gave voice to that. And that was not uncommon. Jesus was from the Galilee, and the Galilee had a lot of more mystics and people who were you know, interested in overturning the Roman rule of the time. So this is John Dominic Crossan's thesis, that, that Jesus fit in that. Mm -hmm. And he actually, and I have a whole chapter in the, in the book about the Lord's Prayer, uh, and, and a lot of the thinking I, I discussed behind it is really from John Dominic Crossan that there's a lot of hidden imagery or hidden messages in the prayer, and not really so hidden. A first century Jew would have understood them, but they're hidden. If we just, if we just read the Lord's Prayer as typical, you know, uh, give us this day our daily bread, you know, so forth, you miss it. But there are, there are um, our Father who art in heaven, just that phrase, our Father who art in heaven, who art in heaven is a very pointed critique of Caesar. Because Caesar was often said, our father, but then it's saying, actually, no, no. Our father is in heaven. So it's a subtle way of saying the Roman ruler is not really our father. And there are other messages. So I have a whole chapter in the book sort of deconstructing that prayer, each line, talking about what its sort of more political implication is. Uh, so a lot of that was going on. Today, we have a whole new group, and I, I sort of consider myself part of this, and, and there are others, but sort of looking at Jesus not so much as a political revolutionary or a social justice revolutionary or a political revolutionary, but more as a kind of teacher of Judaism, a different, a, a rabbi, essentially. Uh, there was a book that came out about 10, 15 years ago called Rabbi Jesus. It was a, a good book. I take a little bit of a different approach, but the, the idea was... <clears throat> we can look at the way Jesus taught with stories and parables and kind of aphorisms, and we can see that as, as a kind of expression of Jewish literature, of Jewish teaching. And we can look at all the different Old Testament Hebrew Bible quotes that Jesus used and see how he used them essentially as a form of midrash, that in a way Jesus was a first century rabbi, you know? And, you know, Paul, you know, I, Paul is such an interesting, you know, figure. So, you know, the, the letters of Paul are some of the great works, I think, of, of, of Western literature, if you read them that way, not as much as religious documents, but as sort of literature. But Paul, in a way, transforms Jesus into using Greek category, you know, transforms Jesus into sort of a Greek mythic hero figure. But in, its, in Jesus' original expression that we see in the Gospels, he's much more of a rabbi, a first century teacher. <clears throat> and rabbis were critical of other rabbis. So when Jesus is 
insulting the Pharisees, that's not uncommon. You just go to Israel today and pick up a newspaper and see what people say about one another in the newspaper, and you get a sense that, you know, when you know people are not shy about insulting others. And so, in a sense, that's what Jesus was doing. This was not hatred. It was part of the debate and air of the time. And so that is how I've come to see Jesus and in some ways how I teach about him uh, in different venues. And one of the fascinating things is in, in, in writing the, in, in speaking about this book, I've spoken at um, evangelical churches. I've spoken at Willow Creek, not far from here. I've spoken, I've, I've uh, met with students, you know, one of my person who blurbed my book is a professor at Wheaton. Um, so, and then I've spoken in Unitarian churches. And, uh, uh, and so I've hit really a range of people. And <clears throat> I think that is, to me, that's been a gift because we live, I th- we, we live in, a, in, a, in a world in which there's so much about religion that divides us, right? We just open up the papers in, in Israel and, and understanding the roots of our faith, we can actually see that there's much more in common than, we, than not. Now, that doesn't mean the differences are unimportant. I actually love interfaith dialogue where we, where we disagree. I've done a couple talks, this was a few years ago, at a church in Glen Ellen, and we went back and forth, you know, you know, people said, well, so what do you do? Why don't you believe Jesus was the Messiah? And, you know, and I said, well, we, you know, ha, ha, how can you, you know, w- w- what's the evidence for resurrection? I mean, we, 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 we went back and forth on areas where we disagreed, and that was a very enriching conversation. And that, those are wonderful when you do them with respect. But it's really powerful to go back and see what common themes do we see in different religions. And in Christianity and Judaism, the themes are extremely similar. So I was thinking about one of the, 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 I have another book coming out in, a, uh, in about uh, eight months, which is much more about, it's a more popular book about um, happiness and well-being and, and, and what are different religious teachings that can enrich that. But I, I want to write a book called The Jewish New Testament, uh, an, an introduction to the Talmud, because I really think the Talmud the Talmud and the New Testament are really very similar books. And what they are doing is by the time you get to the first century, the world of the Bible is no longer. The temple is destroyed. You know, people are more settled and agri- you know, the Bible reflects at least some of it, some of it's more agriculture, but the Bible reflects a, a nomadic world where people are moving around a lot. By the time you get to the first century, people are more settled. So the whole cultural context of the Bible is no longer there. It would be like trying to construct a society based on you know, the laws of Shakespearean England. So there had to be change. And the New Testament is a form of adapting the message of the Old Testament to this new changing context. And so is the Talmud. They're just two different approaches. And so this, this book would kind of look at the Talmud in a more cultural context than a religious context. <clears throat> it would be a tough book to write, so I'm kind of putting it off uh, for as long as possible. But, um, but that's really what, what's been a joy of writing this book. And so the, 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 wherever you are on the religious spectrum, I think um, you can kind of get something, see some of the common themes within Judaism and Christianity, and really the religious fertile environment that was the first century uh, um, Palestine. That's partially what I tried to convey in the book. So I'd love to hear your questions, things you're wondering, uh, anything you've ever wanted to ask a rabbi, you know, uh, I'm, I'm here. Hello, Rabbi. Your presentation was excellent. Thank you. Um, the uh, count in the uh, New Testament of uh, the Paul on the uh, road to Emmaus with the blinding light and all, what is your opinion of what happened there? Ah. Well, I mean, people have religious experiences all the time. So I think it was probably some kind of religious experience. I don't know whether it was, you know, how he understood it as, you know, a conversion experience. Uh, I just understand it as more religious experience. Um, you know, I try to shy away from pronouncing on the uh, 
validity or truth of different parts of the Bible? Because I think religion at its core is not really about fact or fiction. It's really about sort of where we put our commitments. So I don't know whether, look, I, 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 I can't, I don't think the past, the Exodus as it is traditionally described actually happened that way. Uh, and so probably the experience, the conversion on the road probably didn't happen exactly that way. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a heartfelt commitment by Paul. So, so I think we, in Judaism, the, or in Hebrew, the word for faith, there really isn't a word for faith. It's faithfulness. So when we commit to a religion or to a philosophy, I think of it more as not about did this happen or not happen, but more where do we put our loyalties? So that's, that's my kind of long-winded answer. Who were the Sadducees and how do they fit into this? Great. So Sadducees, so Josephus wrote that there were three different groups, three primary groups at the time um, of, of the life of Jesus. The Sadducees, the Essenes, and the Pharisees. The Sadducees were the priests. They were the um, sort of elites of society. They, not only were they the priests, they were kind of the ruling party. And they negotiated with the Romans. They were, they were the more believers in compromise with the Romans. Uh, and they were a small group, probably one to 2% of the population, but a very powerful group. The Essenes had been Sadducees, but they left and went to the Dead Sea caves, caves of Qumran, uh, and formed the Dead Sea sect that we know about from history. Uh, and then, then there were the Pharisees, and then there were just the masses who were much bigger. But the Sadducees were the small group of elite priests. In terms of the, the book you wrote, how is it accepted amongst other rabbis and other you know, ministers? The book? Well, so it's interesting. Uh, there are some rabbis who think I'm, you know, I've been accused of, uh, of, uh, of sort of being synchro synchronistic. So s synchronistic is where you combine parts of different religions uh, that you shouldn't really combine. Like when I, in my book about Passover, I said it's totally fine for Christians to have a Passover Seder which I do believe. Uh, uh, and, and some people said, oh, that's horrible. It's a Jewish ritual. It would be like a Jew having communion, which I don't think that analogy is fair. I, I think the Old Testament is part of the Christian Bible as well, and this is a story that resonates for Christians. Um, there are some rabbis who resist talking about Jesus at all. In fact, I once gave a talk at a synagogue uh, for a men's group, uh, and a ultra-Orthodox rabbi was there, and he was a perfectly nice guy, and we talked after the program, but he would, not, he would only say J. He would not say, because it's, it's like almost sacrilegious to acknowledge this name. So I've had a little bit of pushback, but, but not much. You know, I, I, think, I think in many ways we live in, in a wonderful world in which there's greater openness and, and, and dialogue, and you know, I mean, I think I quote, there's a couple of, I, 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 I quote the Pope, I think, in my introduction, uh, talking about how you know, we have to learn about Judaism in order to understand Jesus. And you know, President Obama has hosted a Passover Seder at the White House. So you know, there is so much um, interconnection that, that I think the, the, that old world is, is sort of fading away. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>